time where we could just leave all of our distractions and all of our thoughts and just focus on Jesus because that's what we came here for.
Good morning. Uh, I'm Ted Misaka, one of your super seniors, strictly by age. <laughs> you know, it, it's just like I just joined the fellowship in a very short time, but somebody tells me it, it's been over four years already. Where uh, a group of us came from Orange Coast and joined your fellowship, and why I chose this fellowship is because Carol, Kevin's dad, worked at the same company I did for years. 
And the other reason, we only live about four blocks across Alicia. <laughs> and that grand, you know, uh, the Lord loves us. And we should love him too. And when I pray, really what prayer to me is communicating with the Lord. So I want you to present your petitions and your praises to him also as I pray. Join me in prayer. Father, we thank you again for being the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. We praise you for your glory. We praise you for who you are. We praise you with our limited understanding how you can be the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. How you love us, how you take care of us. I ask and plead with you to bless each one here this morning that we will receive your message, your joy. Bless our message this morning that we may learn, we may receive, and we may give. Pray for all the problems we have in this world, especially Ukraine and the Pacific, and give us the peace and joy to know that you're still in charge, that all things will work together for good. Bless those, especially those that are affected by it immediately. We pray that it will come to a peaceful understanding that each leadership will give their love to all those concerned so we don't have any more tragedy, any more wars. Just love and joy. May we seek you. May we look forward to you, knowing that all things work together good, especially because you sent your son, Jesus, our Christ, who gave us so many answers, and yet we're still confused and puzzling. May we extend this love that he shared with us. We praise you in the name of Jesus, our Christ. Amen. It's okay. Thank you so much. Uh, at this time, we're going to ask that you stand and greet one another. And as we're doing that, children, you are dismissed to Discovery Land. You can go in the back, and Auntie Helena is back there for sure. If you're not sure where to go, she's standing there with a, with a clipboard, and we'll guide you where you need to go. Well, good morning to all of you. I um, was sitting in my seat and knowing that I was going to stand up here in front of you and I was just, I couldn't help but feel I just would like to sing and have pray, uh, Ted pray for us the rest of our time. And that would have been just fine. But I am really thankful that I have a moment, a few moments uh, to spend with you. And I have a sincere desire as we spend our time together, that I'll have some things from the Lord that will help you in your walk with Jesus. So uh, today is Communion Sunday, and we actually have Communion Sunday about once a month here at our church. But rather than just tag this activity onto the end of a few minutes of our service, I Kevin and I were talking, and I asked if I could use our teaching time to explore more of what Jesus has time to explore more of what Jesus has in mind for us as we come to the Holy Communion table together. So I'm going to share a funny story, 
hopefully with a purpose. And then I'm going to read an entire chapter from the Gospel of John. And after that, I'm going to make a few comments and highlight some of the things that Jesus is trying to teach us there. <clears throat> and then we will come to the Holy Communion table and share that meal together. Okay? All right. And we'll be out on time, for sure. Okay, so f first, first a story about a favorite memory of mine well, in our family. So for background's sake, you have to... <clears throat> You have to understand that in the family that I married into, I am very special. And I'm special for a reason, and I'll explain. You see, Jill's brothers, her brother Paul, who's sitting back in the sound booth, and her brother Mark, who lives in Texas, both married Japanese women. Now, Yoko here, officially, is Hapa. But in the mind of my father-in-law, she was born in Japan, she learned to speak Japanese at a young age. So she, for all intents and purposes, she is officially Japanese. And, uh, <clears throat> and Jill's sister, Leanne, married a Japanese man. And Jill married me, a not Japanese man. So, and to complicate things further, my ethnic background is a bit of a mystery because of my family history. We don't know exactly, or uh, earlier on in our marriage, we didn't know exactly what part of the Caucasian world I came from. <clears throat> and this seemed to uh, sort of bother my father-in-law a little bit. He seemed to want to know what I was. And so uh, early in our marriage, we were sitting at a family dinner and uh, he called out to me from across the table. He said, Randy, what are you? <laughs> and it was kind of out of the blue, but I totally understood that he was talking about, because we'd had conversations before. He was talking about my ethnicity, and he really wanted to get to the bottom of this. What are you? And uh, at the time, I didn't have a good answer because of, as I said, my family history kept that a mystery from me. But uh, a few years later, Yoko gifted me, I don't know if you were at that dinner, but she gifted me uh, one of those genetic testing things that help you know your, your family history, your family tree. And so um, <clears throat> I went ahead and I, I uh, submitted the kit, and uh, it turns out that I am, in fact, Caucasian. Now, well, okay, I, a little, it was a little more specific. I'm half British Isles and half German, German, whatever that region is, but I think that makes me Caucasian. So I'm telling you this story because to understand today's passage, we need to know what we are. And of course, we'll think about this in a way that considers much more than just our species, human beings, or our ethnicity, or any other facet of our earthly life which sort of tells us who we are, our age, our gender, right? We talk like that. We say, I'm 55, I'm male, or whatever. Our, our socioeconomic status or our occupation. Now, <clears throat> if the truth about us, the basic reality about us is that we are just physical bodies, just short-lived beings that temporarily traverse this tiny portion of a tiny planet and then just vanish, and then maybe will be remembered for a while but eventually forgotten. If that's true, then it would be true that the only thing that matters is our flesh, our bodies. And that what we should do is feed our bodies with whatever it desires, making the desire of our flesh the most important and top priority. But Jesus understands that his Father and himself and we are not 
just our bodies. And it's from this understanding that he is speaking and teaching, not only in this passage, but all the time. Which is why sometimes, if our thinking isn't quite oriented right, we get a little confused by the words of Jesus. So it really matters that you know what you are. And what are you? Church, what are you? You are a spirit. Your body will die. Despite all of our advanced technology and all of our best efforts, your body is not going to last, the one that you're sitting in right now. And if any of you young folk with really healthy bodies would like some real wisdom about the meaning of life, then I suggest that you put yourself in the company of some of our elderly folk who have learned a few things about their bodies over the years. Your body will die, but you will not. You are a never-ending spiritual being with an eternal destiny to either be unimaginably glorified by God your Father or else frighteningly and heartbreakingly rejected by him forever. You are a spirit. You are a never-ending spiritual being destined either to be unimaginably glorified by God your Father, or else frighteningly and heartbreakingly rejected by him forever. This is the reality that we live in. And you must keep this in mind as we read our chapter of scripture today. If you have a Bible, uh, the verses are not going to appear on the screen. So if you have an app, or if you uh, have your own Bible, it's good for you to follow along, but I'm gonna try and do a good job reading for you. And it's gonna take about 10 minutes, so you're gonna to have to work a little harder than usual. Hopefully I'll do a good job reading so that, that you'll be able to track with this really amazing and beautiful enchanting account of Jesus so many years ago. I drew this picture, by the way. It's, <laughs> I, I'm claiming it so that you won't think some actual artist drew it. I, I drew it on the back of uh, some typewritten pages uh, as I was reading through the passage. And so the, the geography is really specific here. So I thought, I'm just gonna draw this picture. And I, I realized that the scene of this uh, uh, narrative takes place on the Sea of Galilee, somewhat on the northern side. And so, not to get too detailed here, but um, uh, this, the part on the right is what they call sort of the remote area of the lake, where the part on the left, or in the west, would be sort of where the population is in the cities, Capernaum, Tiberius, and all those things. And so, we read in this story that Jesus is traversing back and forth across the lake with his disciples in boats. But it is possible, actually, for a crowd to walk around that northern shore. So you can get around without boats. All right, you ready? This is John chapter 6, starting in verse 1. <clears throat> the whole thing. Okay, John chapter 6, starting in verse 1. And if you do have a Bible app, uh, and you're using that, if you want to get the words that I'm reading... I'm reading the New Revised Standard Version, the NRSV, but any version will work. Here we go. Jesus went to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, also called the Sea of Tiberias. A large crowd kept following him because they saw the signs that he was doing for the sick. Jesus went up the mountain and sat down there with his disciples. Now the Passover, the festival of the Jews was near. When he looked up and saw a large crowd coming towards him, Jesus said to Philip, <clears throat> Philip, where are we going to buy bread for these people to eat? 
He said this to test him, for he himself knew what he was going to do. Philip answered him, I think that's what Philip said. You can't write onomatopoeia here, and, but I really do think he, he said that. <laughs> Six months of wages would not be enough bread for each of them to get a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, there's a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish, <laughs> but what are they among so many people? Jesus said, make the people sit down. Now, there was a great deal of grass in the place, so they sat down, about 5,000 in all. That would, I, I did a little thinking by that, and that would be about, uh, let's see, I think I was thinking, it would be about 50 of, of this, 50 times what's sitting in this room. That's a lot. <clears throat> Then Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated, so also the fish, as much as they wanted. And when they were satisfied, he told his disciples, gather up the fragments left over so that nothing will be lost. So they gathered them up, and from the fragments of five barley loaves left by those who had eaten, they filled 12 baskets. When the people saw the sign that he had done, now you know what the sign was. He took five loaves and multiplied it so much, molecularly, physically, multiplied that much bread so that everybody's tummy was full, 5,000 or more. When they saw that sign that he had done, they began to say, this, this is indeed the prophet who is to come into the world. And when Jesus realized that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, he withdrew again to the mountain by himself. And when evening came, his disciples did not go up to the mountain. They went down to the lake and got into a boat and started across the lake to Capernaum. I was hoping you'd like that. It was now dark, and Jesus had not yet come to them. The lake became rough because a strong wind was blowing, and when they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the lake and coming near the boat, and they were terrified. But he said to them, it is I, do not be afraid. Then they wanted to take him into the boat, and immediately the boat reached the land towards which they were going. The next day, the crowd that had stayed on the other side of the lake saw that there had only been one boat there, and they also saw that Jesus had not got into the boat with his disciples, but that his disciples had gone away alone. Then some boats from Tiberias. Sorry. <laughs> then some boats from Tiberias came near the place where they had eaten the bread, and the Lord had given thanks. So when the crowd saw that neither Jesus nor his disciples were there, they themselves got into the boats and went to Capernaum looking for Jesus. And when they found him on the other side of the lake, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? I want to pause here just to remark that that's a really good question because you, you caught that they were sort of investigating. There was one boat, the disciples got in it, Jesus did, how did you get here? And Jesus answered them. He said, well, while you were sleeping, I walked down past you and I walked across the lake three or four miles, got into the boat and immediately teletransported the rest of the way to Capernaum. He did not say that, did he? Jesus answered them, very truly I tell you, you are looking for me, not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Do not work for food that perishes, but for the food that endures for eternal life, which the Son of Man 
will give you. For it is on him that God the Father has set his seal. Then they said to him, what must we do to perform the works of God? Jesus answered them, this is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. So they said to him, what sign are you going to do? What sign are you going to give us that we may believe it? Sorry, let me say that again. What sign are you going to give us then that we may see it and believe you? What work are you performing? Our ancestors ate manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Then Jesus said to them, Very truly, I tell you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is that which comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They said to him, Sir, give us this bread always. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. But I said to you that you have seen me, and yet do not believe. Everything that the Father gives me will come to me, and anyone who comes to me I will never drive away. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that, has, that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. This is indeed the will of my Father, that all who see the Son and believe in him may have eternal life, and I will raise them up on the last day. Then the Jews began to complain about him, because he said, I am the bread of heaven. I am the bread that came down from heaven. And they were saying, it's not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know. How can he say, I have come down from heaven? Jesus answered them, don't complain among yourselves. No one can come to me unless drawn by the father who sent me, and I will raise that person up on the last day. It's written in the prophets, and they shall all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father, come to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father, except the one who's from God. He has seen the Father. Very truly, I tell you, whoever believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats of this bread will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. Blech! That's, that's what, I mean, also not written, but clearly. The Jews then disputed among themselves, saying, Blech! How can this man give us his flesh to eat? So Jesus said to them, that's Jesus slapping his forehead. Very truly, I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood have eternal life, and I will raise them up on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood abide in me, and I in them. Just as the living Father sent me, and I live because the Father, so whoever eats me will live because of me. 
This is the bread that came down from heaven. Not, not like that which your ancestors ate, and they died. But this, the one who eats this bread, will live forever. He said these things while he was teaching in the synagogue at Capernaum. When many of his disciples, not the crowd, but his disciples, when many of his disciples heard it, they said, this teaching is difficult. Who can accept it? But being aware that his disciples were complaining about it, said to them, does this offend you? Then what if you were to see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? He's talking about spiritual reality, where he was before. It is the spirit that gives life. The flesh is useless. The words I have spoken to you are spirit and life, but among you there are some who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the first who were the ones that did not believe and who was the one that would betray him. And he said, for this reason I've told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted by the Father. Now because of this, because of this long episode that we just read about, because of the crowd going to remote places and eating bread, chasing him down in Capernaum, and because of these words, many of his disciples turned back and no longer went about with him. So Jesus asked the 12, do you also wish to go away? And Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom can we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. We have come to believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. Now, there's so much, and I have had such a wonderful time communing with Jesus over these words in this chapter. There's way more for us to talk about than we have time to talk about today. So I'm going to highlight these three words for you, that we come, believe, and know. So let's talk about coming to Jesus. So what I did was I, um, I put these verses up here for you as I sl went through the whole passage and I wrote down the verses where Jesus talked about coming. So I'm gonna reread those quickly. He looked up and saw a large crowd coming towards him. That's verse five. Everything that the Father gives me will come to me. That's verse 37. No one can come to me unless drawn by the Father who sent me. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. And no one can come to me unless it is granted by the Father. Now, before we move forward, I want to clarify something very important. Coming to Jesus is entirely your choice. Jesus in these verses is not saying that the Father draws some people and not others. Read them again and you will see. These verses, at least in this passage, Jesus is not saying that the Father is drawing some people and not others. It simply does not say that. So we cannot conclude from what he says that if I don't come to Jesus, it's because I was not drawn by the Father. He must not want me and therefore is excluding me from this real eternal life. No. He is saying that the Father, who is spirit, does the work of drawing. It's what he does and it's what he's doing now. And it's because of this spiritual work that he does that we are able as spirits ourselves to
to come to Jesus. He's saying that what is going on in this whole relational dynamic between us and Jesus is spiritual work. Now, this invitation to come is pervasive throughout all that is written about Jesus. And I'd like to send you away with an assignment. Try reading the four Gospels and try to note how and when this invitation to come is given. And I also want to be clear that it's an invitation to everybody. The Father is drawing everybody. When Jesus was here on earth, a person could come to him simply by putting their body in proximity to his body. But nowadays it's different. But that's part of the point of recognizing that he and we are spiritual. And provision has been made for our spirits to come to him. And we can do this at any time, individually throughout our day. And we're doing it now together as we gather. And what we say is, we gather in his name. Believe. This is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and he who believes in me will never be thirsty. This is indeed the will of my Father, that all who see the Son and believe in him may have eternal life. Very truly, I tell you, whoever believes has eternal life, but among you there are some who do not believe. What does it mean to believe in Jesus? This was the one thing that Jesus told the crowd to do when they said, what must we do? So what does it mean? Now I think some confusion has come out of our modern ways of thinking and talking about this word believe or believe in. One of the ways we use this word is to intellectually affirm a particular idea. For example, someone might say, I believe in Jesus to mean that they believe that he exists. Or maybe even they might say, I believe that he died to forgive sins. Or I believe he died to forgive my sins. I believe that he rose again from the dead and that he's coming again and that he will reign forever and ever in a renovated world where there'll be no more suffering, crying, death, or pain. All of these things are true facts. If they're true, Jesus died to forgive sins. He died to forgive my sins. He's coming again, and he rose from the dead. They are facts, but I want you to notice something. If you intellectually assent to these facts, if you agree with them, your everyday actions and thoughts and feelings have no need to be any different than if you didn't agree with them. I'm going to say that again, and I want you to get this because it's important about believing. If you intellectually agree to these facts about Jesus, your everyday actions and thoughts and feelings have no need to be any different than if you didn't agree with them. We know this is true. We know it from experience because we know a lot of people who will say such things are true. But something isn't lining up with the statement of these facts and how they carry out their life. We also know it's true because James, the brother of Jesus, said even demons believe this. <laughs> you can look that up. And besides, if you just read the passage that we just read about, Jesus can't 
have meant it this way. When he said it to the folks who are present with him, he can't have meant, I just need you to agree that I exist. He was standing right there. That wasn't what he was telling them to do. And certainly none of those other events had occurred yet, had they? So what did he mean for them when he told them, the work of God is that you believe in him whom the Father has sent? And what does he mean for us? I think it's an important question because it's the one thing that Jesus said would lead to eternal life. Now, fortunately, Jesus lived in a different time <clears throat> and spoke a different language so that his listeners probably knew what he meant. But I, I do need to tell you, we don't, we don't need to be Greek scholars to understand what he was saying. So just think about it this way. I want you to put in your mind someone who's among your closest relationships, people who know you and love you best. Maybe, maybe when we were children, this was our parents or some other trusted adult. Maybe if you're now married, this could be your wife or your husband. Now imagine that that beloved person, that person who knows you and loves you, says to you, I want you to believe in me. Can you, can you feel the difference just in using your imagination when that person says to you, in their relationship with you, I want you to believe in me. That doesn't mean they want you to believe they exist. It means something entirely different, doesn't it? Now we realize that this beloved person is asking us to place our complete trust and confidence in them. And we realize that in doing so, we may have consequences for our own life. Putting that kind of trust and confidence in another may have consequences for our life. This is what Jesus means. This is what Jesus means when he says what you must do is believe in him. It means to put all of your trust and confidence in his leadership of your life and to do all that he tells you to do. Believing in Jesus means to put all of your trust and confidence in his leadership of your life and to do all that he tells you to do, starting now. And he, only he, will lead you into eternal life. Not doing this leads to destruction and death. And I want to assure you, believing in Jesus, him being who he is, the one, the creator of all things, has set his seal upon. That's what it says there in verse 27. Jesus is the one that the creator of the entire cosmos has set his seal upon. And that means that in putting your complete confidence and trust in the leadership of Jesus of your life, you are in perfectly safe and competent hands. And one more thing. If all this talk about being spiritual makes you concerned about how you're going to get about in your future after your body has died, how are you going to move around in the cosmos during this eternal life? <clears throat> how would you do that if you had no body? Guess what? You're going to get a new one. And this really seems to excite Jesus because he says it four times with such enthusiasm. If you do this, I will raise you up on the last day. It's like he can't wait. 
I will raise you up on the last day. And what a day that will be. There's one more word I want to talk about. It's to know. It's significant to me that after this confusion about eating flesh and drinking blood and words, etc., many of the disciples left Jesus. They did, they did not trust him anymore. They walked away. Now, we're going to try to address this flesh-eating and blood-drinking language in just a minute, but let's enjoy this tender moment between Jesus and the Twelve when he asks them, do you also want to go away? And Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom can we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. So there is actually one more step in this process of life with Jesus. Yes, we come because the Father is drawing us. Our spirits respond. And we learn that we can put our complete confidence and trust in the leadership of Jesus of our life. But this last step is knowing him. And just as believing does not simply mean agreeing to the facts, knowing Jesus does not simply mean knowing information about him. This kind of knowing is experiential. Knowing Jesus means you have intimate relational experience with him in the same way that he knows the Father. In fact, this word used for know, gnosis in the Greek language, was used sometimes as a youth, sorry, let me get the words out. This word for know was sometimes used as a euphemism for how a husband knows his wife in their intimate physical relationship, even as I'm trying to be euphemistic right now, that this word no was used as a euphemism for that kind of relationship. And Jesus talks about this in prayer to his father some chapters later, John chapter 17, when he says, this is eternal life. that they may know you and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Here's, here's my message. Our eternal life, which we can enter into and remain in right now, is participation in an intimately loving community with God right at the center of it all, and each other. Our eternal life, which we can enter into and remain in right now, is participation in an intimately loving community with God right at the center of it all. So, what about this bread and juice today? Now, we know from other writers that on a special occasion, Jesus took a loaf of bread at a special dinner that they were having, and he gave thanks. Did you catch that in our reading, when Jesus had given thanks? And he distributed it to them, and he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. And he said about, he said about the cup of wine that he wanted them to share together, he said, this is my blood, which is poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. <clears throat> but John, in our passage, put it this way. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood have eternal life, and I will raise them up on the last day. For my flesh is true real food. And if you didn't catch this earlier, we're talking about what's really real. What are you? 
What is this? And he explains it. When those who eat my flesh and drink my blood abide in me and I in them. And this freaked his listeners out. They thought it was disgusting. But Jesus explained it plainly. And this is where I need you to remember that you are spirit. It's what you are. And the spiritual reality we live in is more enduring and real than the physical reality which will fade away. This was demonstrated by the miraculous signs that Jesus did. So Jesus said, the words I speak to you are spirit and life. So look at this little graphic I made. It's, it's, it, it can't tell the whole story, but it is meant to help you. Jesus said, to have eternal life, we believe in him. We put all of our trust and confidence in the leadership, his leadership of our lives and do everything he told us to do. He said, eating his flesh and drinking his blood was eternal life. And he said, these words are eternal life. So if you just want a simple understanding of what Jesus is trying to say, he said, the words about my flesh, about my blood, are spirit, and they are life. And so, as we said, believing in Jesus means putting his words, everything he tells us to do, inside of ourselves and living them out as he teaches us step by step. You are invited to come to this communion table today. If I could have the worship team, come on up, worship team. Yeah, there you go. You're invited to come to this communion table today drawn by an invitation from the Father to eat bread and drink juice as a symbol of you receiving in your body and spirit together the real presence of Jesus. Remember the work that is going on when you eat and drink is work that's done by the Father and Jesus. And it's hard for us sometimes to comprehend what we haven't been able to see. As Jesus explained, no one has seen this except me. And so we have to trust him that something wonderful is going on when we, in obedience, eat and drink. This activity that we're about to do will be all of us, as a family, engaging together in a purposeful activity of receiving eternal life from him as we put all of our trust in him and his words. So when you come, and we're gonna ask you to do that, we have uh, stations you can see, you can come up this side, you can come down this uh, aisle to this table or that one over there. So we're gonna sing first. After we sing and the song is over, I'm gonna invite you to come while the music plays. And I would like to, if you can, come as families. And if you don't have your family, join a family and come together and each of you will take from the bread and the cup. We do have uh, those pre-wrapped uh, cups that we've been using uh, during our pandemic season. And if you feel safer taking one of those, uh, you can do that, uh, if that, that is better. But we do also have pieces of bread and cups of juice for you to partake in together as part of this act of faith, believing in, coming to Jesus. <clears throat> and he will. He will raise us up on the last day. You guys sing. I will feast 
inside the table of the Lord. I will feast at the table of the Lord. I won't hunger anymore at His table. And I will feast at the table of the Lord. I will feast at the table of the
already, please go ahead and eat and drink together. Jesus said, whoever comes to me will never be hungry. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. We trust you in our lives, Jesus. that we can only begin to uh, imagine and dream about that you have in store for us, which begins today with our next steps, and which we trust you will carry on into eternity. Thank you. In Jesus' name we come, O oh, wonderful Father. Amen. Thank you so much, Randy. That was a wonderful message and very encouraging. And I'm reminded of how, how good and gracious our Lord is and how generous he is to us. And the next part of our service is uh, a time, it, it is a, a time that we remember how, how good God is, how much he has provided for us. It is a time of uh, offering, a time of uh, reflection and sacrifice and obedience. It is for the people who are part of our church family. So if you're visiting, please don't feel obligated to uh, participate in the offering. We're just glad that you are here. But uh, it is very important. Um, so there are different opportunities, different ways that you can give. There are some offering baskets in the back as you leave. You can give online through PushPay and you can mail to uh, an offering to the church via snail mail as well. And I'd like to pray for our offering time. Heavenly Father, we are, are reminded of how, how good and generous you are to us, and all that we have comes uh, from your good hand. Would you receive our offerings and bless them? Would you... Um, continue to provide for all our needs, and may you use these offerings to be a blessing to all those around us and also to give honor and glory to your name. We thank you when you do pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we have a couple of announcements. One is that if you would like to receive prayer, if anything that was said today really spoke to you or if you have some burdens or concerns, we'll have someone over to pray for you over on the right hand of the, of the sanctuary. And we have another announcement from our very own Jill Rogers. Your own. It's nice to be... Nice to be owned by somebody, not just Randy and my mom and my kids. Um, so take a look at our slide we have up here. What, what, what images does it conjure up for you and what do you see as you look at it? Moms? Laundry. 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 What else do you see? Some togetherness. Some generations gathered together, maybe a, a, a grandmother and a mother doing the laundry together, gathering in the cool of the day to do their laundry. I see muscles. Did you see the muscles on that lady? Uh, it's an image for us. Um, we, are, we are relaunching our women's ministry. It's called Sacred Streams, and this is, uh, this is for us an inspiring image of what we're hoping for, where multi-generations of women can gather together to, um, to meet and do our daily chores of life, but to speak life and encouragement as we do that along the way. Inevitably, when women get together, they talk and they share, and they don't have to have makeup on. They could come with all the tasks that they have to do and do it together and share in it. So we are gonna begin meeting in person again, and in our first luncheon is gonna be next, Saturday, next Sunday 
after service in room seven. And so we'd like to get a head count because we want to share a meal together. And Jesus said, as often as you do this, remember me, as often as you share and eat bread and wine together. So we're gonna have a meal together every time we meet once a month on the third Sunday. We'll have a luncheon, but we just we would love to get a head count. So there's a sign up outside and there's also um, an online version that's going out. If you know that you're not on the email list, would you please sign up so we could get you in that distribution so you can hear what's coming. We want to be not just a women, a group of women who are getting our chores done and finding encouragement, but we want to be a group of women who are thriving in our relationship because of Christ and what he's done and the communion. Thank you, Randy. Mm -hmm. Today's message was so life-giving and encouraging, and so we want to come and know and believe together as we share in our women's ministry. So please join us every third Sunday for a luncheon together. Thank you so much. And you are excused. We have a closeout song and, and time for come get prayer if you need it. Thank you. I will feast at the table of the Lord. It's there. I will feast at the table of the Lord. I won't hunger anymore at his table. i
As we uh, close out our service, I'd like to acknowledge and pray for one group of people here. I don't know if you know, but today is Grandparents' Day, and there were some special uh, treats for any grandparent here. So if you did not get one, make sure you grab one on the way out. But if you're a grandparent, could you just raise your hands super high here? All right. Thank you, grandparents. And none of us would be here without grandparents. But I know sometimes people feel like as they're getting older, they don't have as much to contribute. But please know that, that we are blessed to have you in our presence. And you do have a lot to offer, your wisdom and your experience. And as Randy was saying, just walking with Jesus for all these years means more to us than we could ever say. So thank you for being here. What I would love to do is pray for you and then send you off with a blessing. Heavenly Father, we are reminded that you are our Heavenly Father, and you have um, entrusted us with parents and grandparents, and we are so grateful for that. Would you bless the grandparents here as they are stewarding their time and opportunity and relationships? May they feel your guidance and your presence every day of their lives. Would you give them um, hope and peace and joy um, for today, tomorrow, and in the future? And we thank you for them. And now I would love to send you off with a blessing. So if you would receive this blessing, may God bless you and keep you. May his face shine on you. May he be gracious to you. May he lift his countenance on you. May he give you peace. And may you walk with Jesus as Lord and Savior and friends today, tomorrow, and forevermore. Amen. Thank you, everyone. Have a great week, and we will see you next week.